I V M. One of the greatest signs of privilege in the modern world is how many things we take for granted. Looking at myself, for example, I take it for granted that I have a roof above my head and will have one for the foreseeable future. I can eat when I'm hungry. I will always have access to drinking water. In fact, a friend of mine recently pointed out that thanks to technology, the next generation will never know what it is to be lost. Imagine that GPS Zindabad. Well, today's episode is about water, which is something that people like me are lucky enough to take for granted, while millions in this country are not. Now, usually things get better, but in this regard, matters might actually get worse. We think of water as an endless resource, but could India actually be running out of water? Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen. In one sense, India has had a water crisis for decades. Millions of Indians don't have access to clean drinking water, but those who run the country take it for granted. I always assumed, though, that the issue here was distribution. I thought, well, we have the ocean on three sides. We are a land of rivers. It's just a question of using technology to make all this water drinkable and then distributing it efficiently. Well, I discovered while recording this episode that my notions about water were completely wrong, and that we might be headed for a water crisis. My guest for this episode is Vishwanath S. He is well known on Twitter as Zen Rain Man, and has been an activist for water conservation for over three decades. I'd heard a lot about him, and as I didn't know anything about the subject, I invited him over for an episode. We recorded this in Bangalore a couple of weeks ago. Listen in. Vishwanath, thanks so much for coming on the scene and the unseen. Pleasure. Uh, Vishwanath, you worked in the field of water conservation and uh, in the field of water generally for more than three decades now. Thirty-two uh, years. For thirty-two years, and these days there's been a lot of news about Bangalore's water woes and so on and so forth. Can you contextualize our current problems for me a little bit? Ah, oh, well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, India is a bit peculiar as compared to other countries when it comes to how it accesses water. Uh, one striking example for me, which has driven me to work in this particular sector, also has been the dependence on groundwater. We have uh, close to 33 million wells and bore wells. We take out 250 cubic kilometers of water. That's groundwater every year. So this is far more than what the next two nations, China and the USA, combined to. Together, China and USA take about 220 cubic kilometers out. India takes 250 cubic kilometers of groundwater out. So this dependence on groundwater is something stunning. For so I, I'm a complete layman. So excuse me for this very uh, sort of noobie question. But uh, um, how do the other nations then get their water? Like if, if we are different from depending so much on groundwater? Right. I think uh, the other nations, China and the USA, are. To a large extent, dependent on surface waters, right? Waters from rivers which they stock up in reservoirs, right. dams, and then pump it across or canalize it across the country. But in itself. our case, we are dependent more on uh, drilling underground and uh, water. We dam. have been to for uh, a long, long time. We have depended on groundwater. It dates back to the Indus Valley civilization, uh, Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, Lothal. We have a history of open wells. which provided water and this is striking again because it's called the indus valley civilization yet the habitations actually took their water from groundwater so wh- why was that i mean you'd imagine a land with so many rivers uh, would uh, you know not have this kind of uh... well uh, it looks like a historical coincidence but let's look at it from also uh, the other lens of uh, what i would call water romance which i'm pretty much uh, romantic about uh, this discovery that a hole in the ground could yield water was something stunning for civilization some a tectonic shift happened you were no longer tied to the tyranny of rivers and lakes you could go to the countryside dig a hole in the ground find water and survive and looks like the ancients in india cracked that particular form of knowledge so therefore you were anywhere and everywhere and remember this country of ours what is now what we call india is two thirds semi arid it's in the deccan plateau right. so the rivers are ephemeral they're not permanent they're not perennial rivers and then when you have to survive for the whole year you look for solutions and the well was a striking solution so what are the implications of our dependence on groundwater those 
here's the thing uh, till we were dependent on open wells uh, there was a, a strange sort of communication between the ecological resource that is water and us as human beings so the wells spoke to us it would tell you summer is coming so you started to alter your behavior depending on the water availability the well was both functional and communicative it rewarded you for good behavior if you recharged around the surrounding areas if you protected the forests then the well had plenty of water if you dumped waste material well the well would get polluted and you wouldn't be able to use the water so these signals of communication and functionality was something striking about the well come the 60s and then we slipped into the era of the bore well the bore well stopped communicating to us they only communicate to us twice once when they strike water and once when they are dead actually because we no longer see what's happening to water levels how they're changing with the seasons and we can't adjust accordingly so that information has stopped absolutely the bore well does not let you know how much water there is what is the source of that ground water where is it coming from what is the quality of that ground water what can you do to protect it how much of it are you using up all these signals are completely lost with the borewell so what are sort of the seen and unseen effects of borewell drilling like what were the advantages which led to that being adopted right. as a technology in the first place and what eventually happened so there's a strange coincidence to the entry of the hard rock drilling rig uh, into india um, documented by unicef uh, amongst others in the 60s the mid 60s there was a continuous drought for 3 years and there was actually famine there was food shortage and great water shortage and unicef brought in these drilling rigs from the uk denmark and the usa hard rock drilling rigs about 18 of them and started drilling for water these went off into the villages of bihar up madhya pradesh and uh, they brought life saving water so they were a big boon at that particular point of time because the wells had dried up the bore wells had to be dug to about 100 200 feet uh, which the wells would not have reached and uh, then the hand pump was attached to it and life saving water came but in a peculiar indian tradition we took the drilling rig jugadified it and started to make the rig itself the small town of tiruchengod in tamil nadu is now w- one of the leading exporters of borewell drilling rigs in the world these rigs then started to get used for irrigation and agriculture farmers started to drill it they were uncontrolled nobody controlled the number of wells that were being dug and actually the political establishment started to give free electricity for the pump sets to mine water from these and so they spread rapidly became politically uncontrollable and started to exploit a lot of water two consequences the benefits of course of the green revolution came from groundwater a lot of people argue not from the dams of india Uh, the second uh, consequence on health for a long for a short time diseases like the guinea worm were eliminated uh, waterborne diseases became less because groundwater was pure water but slowly poisons such as fluoride and arsenic started to emerge now we have uh, a situation because of our dependency on these deep bore wells that about 66 million indians are consuming fluoride contaminated water and about 18 million indians are con- consuming arsenic contaminated water what was quite a revelation so the the first seen effect of bore wells was effectively that it played a part in enabling the green revolution which of course saved millions from possible starvation and uh, was a big boon to us and the second effect was that uh, diseases like guinea worm for example completely vanished and uh, you know before i ask you to elaborate on the unseen effects you spoke about how the spread of bore wells um, was Uh, you hinted that it was perhaps more than it should have been uh, and uh, you know partly because of government incentives like uh, free power which allowed people to pump up as much water as they uh, wanted and uh, we started we jugarified and we started making them ourselves and uh, can you elaborate uh, uh, on that a bit like how 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 like was the was the spreading of bore wells at at what point does it sort of become a, a con rather than a pro yes uh, that's an interesting question i think in the in, uh, initial days when uh, the geological society of india which was one of the strong proponents of the hard rock drilling uh, rig and the bore well went about its business farmers did not believe that a 4 inch hole in the ground could actually yield water so they had to be persuaded by scientists to actually drug these uh, bore wells and drew the clean water out and i think even in the minds of the geologists it was not clear that we were going to run out of ground water because we had not formed a good idea of how much water was actually there what was the volume that was being recharged annually and what were the areas from which these deep bore wells were being recharged i think that hydrogeological science is only now developing in india 
we are doing something called sub-aquifer mapping, trying to understand these hard rock aquifers in a more thorough manner, which we did not ha- uh, know in the 60s and 70s. So we went about assuming infinite resource. And I think that was the handicap. So one does not lay blame uh, on uh, a deliberate attempt to create a scarcity, but this is the very nature of technology and science. It seems that we create problems and then overcome them with solutions which are actually greater problems. And so then the cycle continues. Except that, you know, with most everyday technology, like if there's a bug on the latest Android version, it's fixed really fast and the information is flowing really fast. And here, because it's geology and you don't really know what's under the earth, and it's something that can take decades to play out and affect millions of people. Absolutely. And uh, how many hydrogeologists are produced in India? It's a good question to ask. And where do they go? Most of them went to the oil industry. So we had a lack of human resource power, we still have a lack of human resource power, given the complexity of the science. Who has to do the investments in managing groundwater? Is groundwater a government resource? Is it a common pool resource? Is it a private resource? It's now managed as a private resource. When do we flip from being uh, from uh, turning it into a common pool resource from a private resource. And then who does those investments are big question marks even now. So one of the unseen effects that you pointed out, of course, were the new diseases that came about, like chloride poisoning and so on and so forth. But, you know, going even beyond that, as our knowledge grew of, uh, uh, you know, how scarce groundwater might be, how it gets depleted, where it comes from and so on and so forth. Looking at those learnings, what can you say are the, uh, and also the point you made about the information that a person living on the land has about the water content of the land disappearing because you, this was now unseen, the, the water that the borewell was striking as opposed to the seen water in a well, which you're in, in touch with every day. How did all of this play out? What are the long-term unintended consequences? So, one uh, unintended consequence is the drying up of the Peninsula rivers. A lot of people don't get the fact that it's not merely depletion of catchments and cutting down of forests and trees, but it's actually the sinking of the groundwater table through millions of bore wells, which causes our rivers to dry up. And so if we want to revive our rivers, which is now quite uh, the thing with society, then we have to get our groundwater tables high. Um, It's uh, a relationship not understood pretty well. Uh, The second point is... uh, what it did was it caused farmers to take loans to drill bore wells. Enough uh, evidence has come that farmers would take loan after loan, sink bore well after bore well in this desperate chase for water because that was his only source of water for whatever so he So he would grow. have to drink multiple bore wells because he'd drink, dig one and then that would get over and he'd have to dig another one? The so thing with hard rock terrain is that if you drill a bore well, mm. it's not a guarantee that you will strike water. Right. You may drill one four meters away and it may strike water because these waters occur in cracks and crevices which are limited. There's not a sponge-like aquifer which the well would have tapped into. Right. So this uncertainty of being able to strike water was a clear factor in hot rock bore wells and this caused tremendous agricultural distress. So what followed from this? Like, Take me on a narrative like through the decades, like in the 60s, you, you have problems of food and water and then you have these bore wells coming in they enable the green revolution and it, it seems like a technological miracle and by and large the green revolution was uh, something uh, which uh, helped millions of people enormously but then through the decades a story then starts playing out where people gain more and more knowledge about what it's actually doing to the groundwater and we start facing the consequences so sort of tell me that story through the decades well yeah okay so let's see the india is getting independent in 47 our population is about 330 million um, we are a nation growing just about enough food for ourselves slowly the population starts to increase in the 50s we are faced with a set of droughts and in the 60s it becomes uh, striking because we get a three-year drought continuous drought and then we have a hand-to-mouth living as is described with grains coming from the usa pl480 at the time there's a war with pakistan 65 coincidentally or otherwise and now our dependence on food becomes a security risk for us so we start to think what we should do c subramaniam steps out Professor Swaminathan and uh, meet Norman Borlaug and the high-yielding dwarf variety, the Mexican dwarf variety of wheat comes to India. This dwarf variety needs uh, actually more water and it needs lots of groundwater for its productivity to increase. It needs fertilizers, it needs pesticides. Then comes the rice. The International Rice Research Institute is established in Odisha 
to begin with, later on shifted to the Philippines, they developed IR64, a wonderful hybrid variety, which comes to the Tanjavur belt, which is in the Kaveri area. These uh, wheat and rice strains are now demanding water, they're pro- producing food security. And informally, subversively, farmers are drilling bore wells to feed this water. But we are fixated on the food output. We are not looking at what's happening to the water depletion. And slowly, the spread of this, both these varieties is all across India. In the meantime, the hard rock drilling rigs have come, technologically speaking. They have started to replace the traditional diesel pump or the animal-driven uh, lifting devices. They now start to dig deeper and deeper and start to move everywhere. Free power has started to be given to the farmers because the farmer lobby is a strong lobby, agriculture is a strong lobby. And so therefore, this depletes groundwater even further because it's indiscriminate use of uh, the groundwater. It's flood irrigation. It's not drip or sprinkler irrigation. And slowly, eventually, we are into 33 million bore wells and 250 cubic kilometers of water over time. Now we realize the gravity of the situation. We start to figure out areas where groundwater is depleting and we try to bring control through law doesn't work. None of the places in India, groundwater rules and uh, legislations are working because the number, sheer number of bore wells to manage and regulate has become too huge. Now we are in an era where we want to recharge the aquifers and try to make it up, but we still have not found an idea for demand management. Until we find a balance between demand management and what goes in into the groundwater as rainwater, strike a balance, we'll be in for tough times. And, and and this seems like an almost insurmountable problem because at the policy level, the government will, of course, say that we need to uh, uh, not destroy that depleted resource. We need to figure out a way to make it better. But at the individual level, the incentive for the individual farmer always will be to make sure that his next crop has the water it needs. And therefore, right. he doesn't give a damn. And farmers are an important constituency. And uh, uh, politicians, therefore, have to uh, kind of listen to them. Can't go against them. That's true. But however, there are... Uh grains of experiments which are now happening where we are turning the resource into a common pool resource and uh, there's a particular program called the participatory groundwater management which uh, the group which I'm working with, Argyam, it's a fund- funding agency, is also funding and we're trying to bring together pools of farmers who pool their groundwater bore wells. So let's imagine about 40 or 50 farmers come together, link up their bore wells, use drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation so that they are effective Put up a rain gauge in the place and understand how much it rained. Based on the rainfall, take a call on how much water has recharged these bore wells and therefore use and grow crops which require less water than what it rained. So if this year it rained less, you grow millets. If it rained more, you grow paddy, that kind of a call. You link up that groundwater and build that groundwater knowledge, link the bore wells. The pooling also brings in market feasibilities. Uh, You can buy seeds cheaper. You can sell to the market as a cooperative, as a unit, as a producer unit. These experiments seem to show a glimmer of hope for the common pool resource that groundwater has become. Are they just sporadic efforts made by organizations like yours? Because it imagined that it's actually in the farmer's long-term interest to pool together and do this for various reasons, not just the water, but also the collective power they get when it comes to uh, uh, the marketplace. And therefore, it, this is something that should be happening anyway, regardless of uh, any impetus coming. Is that the case? Or do you f- have you found that that impetus is required? So here's the thing. The institutional architecture of groundwater governance in India is varied from state to state because groundwater and water is a state subject. One of the better forming, performing institutions is the Groundwater Survey and Development Agency, which is in Maharashtra. And Maharashtra has taken up very formally this way of pooling groundwater and trying to work on it as a modality. And we are eagerly waiting for the kind of results that will come there because that will set an exemplar for other states to follow. There's no other choice. Um, We have to make it work. But we have to get these institutions to be full of specialities which can deal with societies, not just groundwater alone. So far, we have thrown hydrogeologists. Now we need community mobilizers. We need people who can organize farmers groups. This is a different skill set altogether. So the governance architecture of groundwater will have to be reimagined and it will have to change. So give me a sense of, to un- to understand uh, the situation we are in and the crisis that there is, give me a sense of the worst case scenario. Supposing, Vishwanath, you don't exist and this governance architecture doesn't take place and uh, there's no one really doing anything about this and it's just individuals going by without that larger knowledge that you have gained. What's the worst case scenario? What can happen? 
it's playing itself out in many parts of uh, the country it's playing itself out in north gujarat uh, it played itself out in chennai that groundwater ran out completely that societies had to migrate out there was great agricultural distress economic distress people struggled for drinking water drinking water had to be shipped in trains and trucks and tankers in, in, in gujarat Vietnam, in gujarat and maharashtra and karnataka right. in many places in many habitations the groundwater has simply run out hmm. there is no life without groundwater you'll so you'll see great patches of uh, india which will simply be not occupied because there's no groundwater and mind you when groundwater tables fall forests will start to die because the roots of the trees cannot get into the aquifers to drink water so right. uh, so you can imagine uh, terrific catastrophes the limited forest cover that we have which feed our rivers will die and so therefore our rivers will be in distress they're already in distress so therefore it's both an ecological disaster as well as a humanitarian disaster because you'll have people migrating away from areas where there's no groundwater and quite apart from the devastation that's already been wreaked on them by having to migrate they'll put pressure on the areas they migrate to who will in turn in a cascading effect face these problems of their own is there any Uh, like you said a lot of nations don't quite depend on groundwater are there other options like if we take it as, as a given that eventually over time the groundwater is not going to sustain us are there other options uh, in terms of uh, you know again i'm asking completely as a layman right. that can fill that need well different uh, areas and different rainfall patterns and different hydrogeologies will have to show a different response kerala in india has the largest density of open wells for any place in the world what kerala is now doing with its rainfall is it's picking up rooftop rainwater many households in kerala and feeding their wells so that the wells are full all the time that the quality of well water imp- improves uh, and it can quickly become a, a mass movement and this is again an innovation that's happened as you pointed out because they get information about what's happening to the level uh, of water in the well and therefore they can prepare in advance and they understand what's happening while with uh, bore well drilling and so on you have no information you assume it's there till it's not there absolutely so so this business of modernity which started to bring piped water to homes with all good intentions to remove the duress that women had to go to bring the water and to make things easier pipe water inside the house cause this disconnect because you don't know where the pipe water is coming from how much there is water in the rivers and all that. so some examples are striking what we are trying to do is to merge both the pipe network as well as groundwater belgaum is a striking example when they ran out of water for their pipe network uh, an engineer there called aras nayak thought about the old open wells there and with the help of the community mobilized and cleaned up those old open wells the community promised not to chuck ganesh idols into it garbage into it in return with uh, some small funding they were able to put up water networks for the local community 500 people 1000 people sometimes even 10000 people a local network linked to the local well piped water to your homes right so here's an incentive for the community to keep their wells clean to recharge water and then in turn they get water as opposed to the pipe water supply which cost them about 12 rupees a kiloliter the water from the well was only 75 paisa kiloliter and i'm talking 75 paisa for a 1000 liter so there's an economic benefit and an ecological benefit and an environmental benefit plus sustainability and this water supply scheme is giving water to 200000 people in belgaum of a population of 500000 people kundapur which is close by uh, started to get 24 bar 7 pipe water supply well when the residents uh, were asked to connect and pay a connection fee they said we already have our 24 bar 7 supply from our wells they're giving us 24 bar 7 and we are in uh, charge of these wells so why do we need your pipe water connection so somewhere these two will have to meet the pipe water network aspirations of the people and the well as a sustainable water resource and the community understanding what the well is and so that challenge will have to be playing itself out differently in states like kerala in small towns and cities and in the vast rural areas of india i mean it seems it, it, it seems a really great challenge because like in a village okay you can have communities and they have wells and so on but in a large city like mumbai or bangalore uh you know you, you don't have those open wells and that sort of connect you are dependent on the pipe water supply and then on the water supply basically so let me give you one more example from bangalore because you raised this important point of urbanization and the complexity of cities and how you manage it and this example is uh, rainbow drive on sarjapur road just opposite wipro 36 acres of campus 360 plots not connected to the city utility network what would they have done each one of them would have drilled a borewell as they build their homes so you would have 360 straws emptying out the 
cup of water, right. each competing with the other, pretty soon it would be finished. When we worked with the community, and the community had some reasonably enlightened leadership, what they did was they banned private borewells. They said, we'll sink three community borewells and we'll share the groundwater. But 360 will now compulsorily recharge the aquifers. So each one of them will make a recharge well, which is about three feet in diameter and about 20 feet to 30 feet deep, pick up all the rooftop water, the water which flows on the roads, and, and make sure that it's filtered and send it into the aquifer. So a recharge well is something that collects all this water? and uh, Unlike a well which gives you water, a mm. recharge well picks up rainwater, right. clean rainwater, and right. puts it into the aquifer. So you got 360 recharge wells, but only three wells which were drying. Still, this was not enough. When we did a water balance for them, we figured that uh, they were consuming 265 liters per person per day. With all the rainwater harvesting they do, it was they were still overdrawing on the aquifer. So they had to get it down to 130. They put a meter in every connection. They price the water. So if it's more than 20,000 liters per month consumption for a household, they pay 120 rupees a kiloliter. Promptly, consumption came down to something like 120 liters per capita per day. With the monies that the institution collected, they were able to invest in a wastewater treatment plant. They pick up treated wastewater and send it to the households for non-potable use. So again, the net freshwater demand has dropped to something like 80 liters per capita per day. They are now contributing to the city of Bangalore. They're contributing water. They're self-sufficient. They're sustainable, and they have perhaps the cheapest water in town. So these kind of examples, this is 36 acres. It's now being replicated in a 70-acre um, layout. It's gone to a 200-acre layout where they've discovered that the basements were flooding and the wells had water, and they were buying water at the same time. So this sort of mental map in which we've forgotten what shallow aquifers and wells are are being regenerated. So th this is obviously a remarkable and inspiring story, but a as you pointed out, it's a community which is relatively small uh, and also had enlightened leaders uh, and, and therefore is sort of uh, one island of enlightenment in uh, overall. So, so my, my, my question to you there is that let's say that as a society, it's a problem we need to solve. Uh, what is... What is the role that A, the government can play in it with all the incentives because they are usually focused on the short term and they have different kinds of special interest groups? And what is the role that we cannot look to government to play, that we have to say that society has to make these moves and these ideas and these values have to spread through society? How hard is that? Can it happen? What yeah. are your thoughts? So that's a, uh, that's the important point. I think the institutional architecture for water governance in India is 20th century. We're faced with 21st century problems. And unless we redefine our institutions and get them to be able, capacitated enough to be able to address our problems, we're going to be stuck with uh, some challenges. Uh, from a policy perspective, the city for, of Bangalore, Chennai, for example, drives a rainwater harvesting policy, which makes it mandatory for every household to do rainwater harvesting. It's not being implemented at the efficiency and effectiveness which it, which it should be, but a beginning has been made. And why it's not being implemented is something that we need to crack because we do not have a good communication outreach to persuade citizens to understand the benefits of doing it. But if we do that, then we have a substantial amount of recharge of our aquifers. So therefore, our borewells and um, groundwater open wells can come back to life. If lakes are rejuvenated, and if they are fed with treated wastewater, so in the rainy season, you feed the lakes with rainwater. In the non-rainy season, you feed them with treated wastewater, which comes in through constructed wetlands. And there's an example in Jakur. There's an example in a lake called Rajanali and Putanali. Many examples are there. Then these lakes recharge the shallow aquifer and a huge amount of groundwater becomes available for the city to reuse, right? So a wastewater policy, which talks about ecological use of waste, treated wastewater to recharge aquifers. A groundwater policy which says, okay, in a particular area, you, you're not allowed to sink individual borewells, but community borewells will supply you water. A rainwater harvesting policy, wastewater policy, groundwater policy, all talking to each other and reinforcing sustainability is the way for government to think and work upon. At a policy level, that's already happening. We need more better implementation. What would you say are the bottlenecks here? Like, is it the government sort of uh, seeing the light or is it a matter of state capacity or is it a matter of communication? Uh, it's again that uh, cities need what is called integrated urban water management institutions, an institution which looks at water holistically. A classic example is Chakur Lake. Now, if you go to the lake, the lake is with the BDA, the Bangalore Development Authority, which is handed over to the Bangalore Mahanagar Palika. The fishes in the lake belong to the fisheries department. The recharge that the lake water does 
is monitored by the mines and geology department in the central ground. So these are like separate silos which completely the wastewater which comes in is managed by the Bangalore Water Supply and Storage Board. The rainwater which comes in is with the Mahanagar Palike. You take any one of this institution to the lake and they're like the six blind men of Hindustan. They just see their point of view and then they come back. Now unless we get these institutions to sit together on one plan of action and management, we have a challenge. Now residents associations are doing the convergence. They sit, they identify a problem. Okay, solid waste is coming in, I go to the BBMP and fix it. Medical waste is coming in, I go to the State Pollution Control Board and make sure that they take action. But that citizen action cannot be long-term and sustainable. Our institutions have to, like I said, reimagine themselves and come together on this common platform. It's possible. It's the long road. It's the harder route. It's not a technical solution. It's an institutional and governance solutions. We need that kind of capacities to come together to reformulate our institutions and governance policies to make it happen. So when you spoke about sort of the the uh, institutional architecture being of the 20th century instead of the 21st century, what you're referring to is that the same thing that they all work in kind of silos, and now we need to recognize the problem and bring it under one authority, which can then uh, you know uh, take these decisions and get it. That's done. one part of the problem. The, the 20th century architecture of institutions was one of supply management. The resource was available in plenty. You needed engineering skill sets to pump water from a large distance. The Bangalore Water Supply Sewerage Board set up in 1964 was the first water utility set up in India. And its biggest achievement was that it brought water from the Kaveri River in 1972 which is 100 kilometers away and 300 meters below the city. Huge engineering challenge. Now the resource itself is running out. But what this institution is geared for is to pump water to the city. So its next imagination is to bring water from the Sharavati River, which is 340 kilometers from Bangalore. Whereas what it perhaps needs to do is to look at the ecological resource available within the city, like rainwater, wastewater, groundwater, uh, and manage it. But there is not a single hydrogeologist in the institution. There's not a single hydrologist. There's not a single ecologist. How can that hockey team play football, which is what is being asked of them? That's a brilliant articulation. And like, like you just pointed out, citizen activism has its limits and you also don't have enlightened citizens everywhere. So what really uh, you need here is, in a sense, political will and governmental will, which are slightly separate things. But those are what you need. What are the obstacles to those? Well, actually, the government, too, is listening. It's not that all politicians are bad. There are quite a few ministers. Who but the incentives are sort of different. They're geared towards the short term, winning the next elections, more towards handouts and deep fundamental change. That is true. The democratic cycle and the ecological cycle of sustainability. This one is a five-year cycle. This one is a minimum 20-year cycle. They don't overlap. And the short-termism and suboptimal nature of democracies start to I- impact it. However, I think we can find a midway by which we commit ourselves to a long-term plan, which is cutting across political frontiers, but then use the democratic cycle for equity and distribution, which is as critical as resource management. The big challenge for our cities is not how much water is coming in, as much as who is getting this water. Here, the political uh, system can play a major role in making sure that there is equity. So I see a lot of merit. But what we need from civic society groups and activist groups is to be able to understand the weaknesses of the system and address those in a solution mode rather than to keep on harping on problems and highlighting problems. Right, right, right. You can, you can keep on saying that um, Belandur Lake is getting sewage, that it's foaming and frothing. But what is the architecture by which you want to manage it? is something that civic and academic institutions, civil society groups, have to come together and brainstorm a bit more. And what I've often heard from civil society activists in other fields is that when it comes to dealing with government, you can uh, sort of push for short-term measures and jugars and little fixes here and there, but changing fundamental architecture is much more difficult because of sort of the incentives involved. So I, I, I sort of now want to talk about your personal journey, you've been in this for 32 years, you've been a sort of an evangelist for uh, uh, reform in uh, all of these. What has that journey been like? Like, to what, uh, what's your struggle been to convince fellow citizens around you of uh, what the problems are? And from there, what's your struggle been to actually uh, make fundamental change happen? Well, uh, it's not been struggle, struggle as in where you see it as a sort of a despondent act. I've had great joy and happiness in being able to understand the complexity of the problem and trying to see how individually and as teams, different kinds of teams, we're able to push the solution envelope a bit more. Luckily, 14 years of my 
initial life in the job sector i spent with the housing and urban development corporation which is the government of india undertaking so i know how the government thinks i was lucky enough to do that and that job gave me exposure to many geographies of south india especially i must have visited every alternate village and almost every town and city as part of that job so it was a huge learning experience and one learned the strengths of government and the limitations of government then once you stepped out the challenge was Uh, how do you work with communities academic institutions and even the government from a policy influence part of you so it's important to build a brand around yourself and a thought process that you do and so that has been very important i think you must be seen as somebody who does not have uh, an agenda which is political or whatever personality driven uh, but which seeks to bring positive change to communities individuals so the response has been fabulous i mean I've, the choice are from working with well diggers traditional well diggers uh, there are a community who've been digging wells in india for 1200 years now and who have run out of a livelihood because nobody is digging wells but uh, everybody is digging uh, bore wells so how do you make sure that they get a job so in the policy we said in the rainwater harvesting policy which was i was fortunate enough to write with the government was to say hey everybody will make a recharge well so suddenly the livelihood opportunities for these well diggers came up and the well diggers learned a new skill and a new trade you pick up rainwater and you send it into wells they didn't know a damn about it now many of these wells have water so there's at least 10000 open wells in bangalore with water in it so people call them again to clean it up every year which was what they used to do before and deepen it a bit more and make sure that the water quality is improved so you see that solving a water problem is also engaging with history livelihoods its economic benefits its social benefits and all these add up to ecological benefits and when you see that canvas it motivates you almost on a daily basis because there's something exciting happening and do you feel you're taking small steps all the time and then it's then that's sort of getting to somewhere really meaningful or do you sometimes feel there's an impasse and i mean oh there's old monk for that but um, the the thing is that uh, the beauty of at least the work that i got on myself was that i was able to engage with one small rainwater harvesting unit which collects 2000 liters of rainwater to be able to sit on writing the wastewater policy for karnataka rainwater harvesting policy for karnataka sitting with the planning commission as one of the subgroup members to be able to address some of those issues so scale ways of thinking institutional governance to actually doing that sort of engagement which really gives you a huge kick right and supposing some of my listeners are listening to this and thinking that hey you know as a concerned citizen i'd like to do something about this now uh, two questions for you on that account one uh, can you explain the scale of the problem what are things like right now and two what is it that concerned citizens can do at a practical level immediately so the scale of the problem is an agglomeration of a million problems uh, if you take a city like bangalore and there are 1.8 million households the city of bangalore's problems of water is 1.8 million problems uh, which then agglomerate so therefore you can become part of that 1.8 million solutions because you occupy one of those households and one of those homes the thing to do is uh, to start to understand what water is in your household level itself and it's not rocket science if you want to you can cut down consumption 30% 40% if intent is there you need space between the years you don't need space anywhere else second is to look at the rainfall in your apartment in your building and see what's happening to it and whether it can be put to better use and one of the better uses is to make sure that it goes and infiltrates into the ground these are immediate actions the second set of actions is to reach out at a community or a watershed level there is a lake within 2 kilometers of every apartment or house in bangalore step in into the lake on a sunday which we try and get what we call friends of lakes to come pick up 10 plastic bags from that lake the next time somebody chucks a plastic bag in that lake and you realize you're going to pick it up it really makes you mad so your ownership of the lake is generated by simple small actions and then work with groups to figure out what needs to be done to save the lake it's not going to be easy but you'll understand the political ramifications the challenges which a city has to go through in managing water and it gives you pretty much uh, Uh, can do kind of a positive moment and i think we need to work at a lot of these can do's at various scales you, know, you engage with your corporator engage with your mla engage with your water utility provider and see how the challenges they think that exist and what can be done by you as a participant you'll find many solutions so i'm going to end with uh, i mean this has been extremely illuminating and i'm going to end with uh, two questions um, one what makes you despair 
about uh, this journey that you're on and what can happen to what India's water problems and to what makes you hopeful? The despair comes from uh, a sort of a binary view that we seem to think that economic development means certain sacrifices and therefore the ecological environment has to degrade. This set of thinking articulated in that river water reaching a sea is a waste. It makes you despair, saying how much more literate should we become ecologically and environmentally? And your point is they can go hand in hand. There's no they, trade-off. They absolutely go hand in hand. There is no binary there. It, they have to coexist together and we have to find, you cannot label people environmentalists or you cannot la- label people pro-market and leave it at that. Both have to talk to each other and reinforce each other and understand each other's problems. But that, that conversation is not deep enough or not uh, smooth enough in the sense we don't seem to be able to sit and dialogue a way out. That's a cause for despair. The cause for hope is to see the millions of actions, fishermen, well diggers, poor well diggers, everybody who's in some way or the other contributing to to make sure that what we have as a society and as a nation stays somewhere reasonably good. So that engagement fascinates me. That's an inspiring note to end on. And, uh, you know, if you're listening to the show, you don't just have to listen to our journey and say, hey, that's nice, but you can also be part of it. Uh, Vishwanath, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's my honor. Uh, it's my pleasure and uh, the Twitter handle is at Zen Rain Man. I have to do this. I plan. always tweet that at the end of the show. Any <laughs> so don't worry, but uh, <laughs> at Zen Rain Man and he tweets regularly about all of these issues. So please go and check that out. And, you know, I, I really hope you write a book about this someday because all of this has been such a learning for me just, you know, talking to you today. And, uh, you know, there's such a great narrative of how our woes with water have sort of developed. Yes, uh, thanks for that suggestion. Uh, I'm basically too lazy a person to be able to sit together and print words. The communication has to be immediate. and Absolutely. These kind of conversations that I have with you, it's such a pleasure to talk because then thoughts flow and we can answer it's questions. It's fantastic and I'd love to have you on the show again sometime. Thanks so much. Vishwan. Pleasure, Raman. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, do follow Vishwanath on Twitter at Zen Rain Man. You can follow me at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. Past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen are available at seenunseen.in. And hey, two final pieces of advice before I go. Number one, please stay hydrated. But number two, don't waste water. While you figure it out, goodbye till next week. If you enjoyed listening to The Seen and the Unseen, check out another show by IVM Podcasts, Simplified, which is hosted by my good friends Naren, Chuck and Shriket. You can download it on any podcasting network. As you can see, we have a podcast listener in his natural habitat. Millions of years of evolution have led him to this point. He's on his way to work and listening to podcasts makes his miserable day better. He will now head to work and use all his knowledge to communicate with other colleagues and possibly future mates. You can find more of his species on ivmpodcasts.com, your one-stop destination where you can check out all the coolest Indian podcasts. Happy listening.